Hello, friends, and welcome to our Monday Thursday devotion for Gethsemane Lutheran. If you're not familiar with Monday Thursday, and it's it's Maundy, M A U N D Y, not Monday Thursday like I thought all the time growing up. It's it's the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples in that upper room, and he when he was there, he gave them what was essentially his last will and testament. He gave them all the things he wanted them to know before he would be executed the next day. He knew that was coming. He he taught them about what was coming. In fact, he taught them about what was coming even after his resurrection, what they would face. And also at that same time, he shared the Passover supper with them. And as part of that, he instituted what we celebrate as the Lord's Supper. And then in particular, he gave a new command. Now, if you don't know, that's where Maundy Thursday gets its name, from the Latin mandato, which means I command. And it was, it was during this, this speech to his disciples that Jesus said, This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you, from John 15, 12. Love one another. It's a, a great command, and it, it so summarizes what God wants us to do in our lives. It's, it's central and pivotal to the life of a Christian. However, like so many things that God tells us, it's very easy for the devil to to twist it, to corrupt it, and to turn those words to his own uses if we're not careful. You might think, how could something as, as wholesome as love one another be twisted to the devil's purposes? Well, we're going to take a look at that. And in particular, we're going to look at an example from the Corinthian congregation because it seems like the devil had done just that at that congregation. And we're going to take a look at what Paul had to write to them in, in a particular section from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 6, where, where Paul writes, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Purge out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch, just as you are unleavened. For our Passover lamb has been sacrificed, namely Christ. So let us keep celebrating the festival, not with old yeast, not with the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He caught what he said at the start there. He said, your boasting is not good. What was it that they were boasting about that Paul had to declare not good? And you can go read it yourself if you want to look at the whole chapter. It seems that Someone, or, or more than one, had begun to engage, someone in that congregation had begun to engage in some aberrant sexual practices. What they are is not so important as the fact that they were clearly against God's commands. But the congregation, rather than correcting their brother, rather than telling him it was wrong, they felt the way to show love was to accept him. And not only did they accept what was going on, they, they bragged about how loving they were in allowing it. It's kind of like, I mean, look at us. Look how great we are. This guy, this guy's doing something so awful, but we love him anyway. Is that it? Is that how Christian love works? Is that what Jesus meant when he commanded love one another? Obviously, Paul says no. And Paul connects this to another event from this evening. He, he connects us to the Passover, which again, Jesus and his disciples were observing that feast on Monday, Thursday. It was something the Jewish people did every year at that time, to remember the first Passover long, long ago when God delivered his people out of Egypt. It was on that night 
that God promised the angel of death was going to come into Egypt. And death was going to come looking for the firstborn son, whether man or animal. Every single one that death found, death was going to take. But God taught the Israelites how to protect themselves. They were to prepare a special meal using, as one of the courses, unleavened bread, which is a flat bread without yeast, and then a lamb. There were other things, but those are the, the key components we're focusing on tonight. And when they killed the lamb to eat it, they were to paint the blood on their door frame, and the blood would cover their house in a sense. When the angel came, the angel would see the blood on the door frame and would ignore that house. Now, for us, that particular night, it was thousands of years ago. But Paul says here in our reading that our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. He says, not a literal lamb, not an animal, but it was Christ. And that's what Jesus did. It's the, the very act of sacrifice that we're going to observe on Good Friday. You see, the Passover was always meant to be an image of something coming. Because death is looking for each one of us, not because we're the firstborn, but because of our crimes against God, because of our sins. The angel of death, as it were, sees our sin, and that's what marks us. And not, not to take our life here and now, but to end our eternal life. Because of sin, we are set to die eternally, to be cut off from God forever in hell. but the blood of the Lamb covers us. Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross so that his blood could be over us, so that that could be the sign for the angel of death to pass over us. He took the punishment for our crimes, and then the perfect life that, that he lived is, is handed to us like a covering. We're covered with, with Christ's blood, with that innocent life, by faith. And death looks at us and he, it, it sees that blood and it just keeps on going. We live because of the sacrifice of the Lamb. Now, how does that apply to what was going on in Corinth? Why does Paul bring that up here? Well, if we are sinners that are targeted by death, and it's Christ that covers us, the actions of those sinners in Corinth was just like tossing off that covering cloak of Christ and shouting, hey, look at me over here, I'm sinning. It's like begging death to find you. And the rest of the congregation were proud of the fact that they allowed this. That is obviously deadly for the person who's caught in that sin, but it's equally dangerous for the whole congregation. Paul uses a, a, a different metaphor here. He uses that of, of bread and yeast. A little bit works through the whole batch, he says. I still remember when I was maybe in my teens, our family got a bread maker, um, and, and one of the things that stuck with me about it, other than the fact that those those little wings in the bottom would make those funny dents in the bottom of the loaf, which I always thought was kind of cool, or occasionally one of the wings would get stuck in there and you'd have to pull it out so you didn't eat that with the bread. But the thing that I always thought was really cool was the little packets of yeast. You just pour in that little bit at the top, it goes into the dough, and, and boom, the, it would spread through the whole loaf and the whole thing would rise fluffy and golden just ready to eat. It was, I loved it. But 
Paul tells us we're part of the Passover celebration. We are to be unleavened bread. We are to be bread without yeast, or in this case, we're to be bread without sin. And he says just a little bit of sin, just that little bit let in, tolerated, allowed to go on unchecked, eventually corrupts the whole loaf. Because, I mean, look at that. That guy over there does it. No one says anything about it. it must be okay for me to do it. And so on, and so on. Sin, left unchecked, destroys faith. And so it gives up that, that covering, that cloak of Christ that brings eternal life. And it encourages others to do the same. The yeast is not good, and a little bit works through the whole loaf. Brothers and sisters... Continue to celebrate the Passover. Continue to be the unleavened bread that God has made us to be. To keep ourselves protected. To properly love each other as God has commanded us. How do we do that? Clearly, it, it doesn't mean that we tolerate sin. Tolerating sin, as we've seen, that that puts the sinner and it puts everyone around in danger of death. And that, that is not loving. We have to be careful not to get overzealous in the other direction either. Because it also does not mean we cast out anyone who sins. That would be ridiculous. We all sin much and daily, as Martin Luther would say. We throw out anyone sinning, there would be none of us left, not to mention the fact that the goal of the church is to provide the gospel to sinners who need to hear about the forgiveness that Jesus has for us. The key here is to understand the difference between sin and unrepentant sin. Because we all sin. Maybe we don't all realize all of them. We, we, we probably don't recognize all the ways we sin every day. But whether we, we see it ourselves or we notice it later, or maybe even just a concerned brother or sister points it out, we hope they do. The heart that loves Jesus, when it sees our, our own sin, says, if God doesn't want me to do this, then... I don't want to do this either. I need to stop. I need to change. And with God's help, I'm going to try. That change may be a struggle, right? But the repentance is what matters. That, that about face of attitude from that sinful action, from that sinful attitude, the, the sin is forgiven. In fact, it's forgiven before repentance happens. And we are covered with the Passover lamb for our eternal life. That is different than the one who hears that what I'm saying or thinking or doing is wrong and then says, I don't care. I'm going to keep doing what I want. That's what Paul's warning about here. That's when you, you throw off the, the covering blood of Christ and, and, and you risk death. And that yeast working through the dough risks everyone around. It should be pretty obvious that letting someone continue on in that attitude is not loving. It risks their eternal life. They're in danger of death. So we have to warn them. Tolerating it is letting them continue down that path of destruction. The loving thing to do is to point it out, to make it clear that they are in danger. 
and to tell them what's going to happen if change doesn't happen. We can't ever let anyone get the impression that the dangerous path is okay. When we gather together as a congregation to build each other up, to lift each other up, to protect and encourage each other with, with God's word and God's power so that we can all go together towards that eternal life God has won for us. Brothers, sisters, on this Monday, Thursday, and always, remember the command, love each other. Remember why we can do it. Be confident in the covering that the Passover lamb has won for you. But be vigilant. Protect that cover life your light, like your life depends on it, because it does. And help your brothers and sisters do the same. Treasure it. Help them treasure it. We need the blood of the Lamb to be safe. But having it, we can rest confident in it. Hold on to it. Help each other hold on to it. That. That is loving one another. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. Brothers and sisters, have a blessed Holy Week celebration and more blessed and joyous Easter to come.